updated. I'm Cam Nugent. Uh, I operate out of the University of Guelph in the lab of Sally Adamovic, and my desk is actually in the Center for Biodiversity Genomics. And today I'm talking about an R package that I've developed as part of my postdoctoral research called DBAR, and how this package is used as a denoiser to improve the accuracy of biodiversity data. So big picture, what we're trying to do at the Center for Biodiversity Genomics and in the Adamovic lab is we're often trying to just answer the question, what species are here? So if we're walking down in the African savanna and we see a zebra, that's a pretty easy question to answer. But this isn't always the case. And a lot of times organisms can be actually rather small and they can actually look uh, very similar to one another. Additionally, not all um, organisms have been characterized um, already. So it's important that we have a way to identify these. And that's where DNA barcoding comes in. So even though some species look very different at different life stages, or they might look very similar to one another, we can use DNA barcodes to identify them in a quantitative fashion. So this is done using uh, small sections of DNA um, that are present in all the organisms of interest. And these uh, barcodes, their interspecies variation uh, exceeds the intraspecies variation, which means that they give a good taxonomic signature where we can get a DNA sequence and say with confidence what species is here. And so for animals, which is what I'll be focusing on today, we most commonly use the DNA barcode cytochrome C oxidase 1, also known as CO1. And this is a mitochondrial gene that's essential to metabolism. So we can rely on the fact that it's going to be present in every animal examined because it's needed for the mitochondria to perform its function properly. So that's the information we're trying to gather. And the tool we're using to gather this information is high throughput DNA sequencing. So uh, since this is a bioinformatics users group, I won't go into too much detail about that, but it lets us get a, a large amount of diff, uh, information in a fast and cost effective manner. Um, and this is great, but it does have certain uh, caveats that we have to address with these data that are produced by the sequencers. So uh, sequencers are error prone. As a huge overgeneralization, we can expect greater than 1% error rates. And if we're dealing with our 657 base pair CO1 barcode, then on any given output, we might be getting six and a half errors. Um, additionally, these errors are non-random. So there's a potential for systematic bias within the data. So something like the PacBio SQL platform um, it introduces large numbers of indel errors, where something like the Illumina MySeq is more prone to substitution errors. And if these errors are being repeated, then they might be interpreted as biological uh, signal when in fact they're just sequencing noise. And as I just stated, these uh, errors are variable across platforms, so it's not just a one size fits all solution. So we want to get the biological signal and separate it from the sequencing noise. And this is called denoising. So we have this power and it lets us uh, get a lot of information, but um, it leads, to, but since the data can be filled with errors, we might get inflated estimates of biodiversity. So if we're looking at a community and conducting something called metabarcoding, which is where we're trying to extract DNA sequences uh, in bulk from all the members of the community, if we don't take out the error introduced by the DNA sequencers, we might uh, overestimate the number of species present. So we have a responsibility to make sure our data are clean and accurate, otherwise we'll inflate these estimates um, and be interpreting noise as signal. So denoising, there are some current methods that exist and these are commonly applied within uh, both DNA barcoding and the bulk analysis of samples term metabarcoding. So um, essentially we see a lot of clustering based approaches which is focused around the concept of an operational taxonomic unit so what this says is no one sequence that comes off of the dna sequencer is correct necessarily but they're grouped into uh groups of similar sequences based on 97 percent sequence similarity and then uh current denoising software um, use various extensions of this clustering based method to try to further refine the sequences. And on the right here is just a good demonstration of how uh, an operational taxonomic unit works. So the gray circle represents the sphere of 97% sequence similarity. All the dots within it are individual DNA sequences. And then for your operational taxonomic unit, you have one centroid sequence, which is the most average of all of them that is sort of taken as the gospel truth sequence or and recorded as the DNA barcode 
for that OTU. So that's the current set of methods, but this has some problems associated with it. So one, if we're operating on clustering and similarity, then we're uh, biasing our data against low abundance samples. So if we're taking DNA sequences from a large number of samples and analyzing them in a bulk metabarcoding situation, something that's actually true but is very rare might be overlooked just due to uh, actual low abundance. Um, secondly, the systematic errors I discussed may be going uncorrected. So if every member of an operational taxonomic unit uh, contains the same insertion or deletion error, then we might in, uh, be in fact recording the wrong barcode. And uh, lastly, there's a larger amount of information known about CO1 that's available on uh, the BOLD database. So this is the Barcode of Life data system that's uh, curated and maintained by the Center of Biodiversity, uh, Center for Biodiversity Genomics, where I work. And it has more than 1.3 million representative sequences that are um, curated. And so these can be used to inform the true biological structure and make sure that the sequences we're looking at are accurate. So the new approach I've been developing is a biologically informed denoising method. So this uses that information on the BOLD database and also the fact that this is an important protein coding gene, uh, this being CO1. And so we can consider the biological structure and this training data that we have in the BOLD database to help overcome some of the systematic errors associated with DNA sequencers and denoise our data. So that's uh, the information we're using. And then the method used is something called a profile hidden Markov model. So a profile hidden Markov model is a probabilistic representation of a multiple sequence alignment. So what that means is if we have a large number of DNA sequences that are aligned, the model uh, learns the probabilities of any nucleotide being present at a position in the profile of the alignment and it learns the probability of transitioning from a given nucleotide to the next. And so as an example on the right here, I have just sort of like a cartoon size uh, set of DNA sequences. So the, uh, the probability of an A at position one here would be 75%. And that would be the emission probability for A at position one. And then uh, two of the three A's are followed by a C. So we would have a transition probability of 66%. A to C, and all the different combinations are learned for every position in the profile. And then this information is stored and used to make predictions about new previously unseen sequences. And it predicts whether any given nucleotide is a match to the profile, an insert, or a delete. I'll get into a, an example in a second. So that's the methods being used. And using that, I developed the R package DBAR. So DBAR. Uh, short for denoising barcodes, is uh, it contains a profile hit a Markov model that is trained on a taxonomically representative set of barcodes from the BOLD database. And the package is currently available on CRAN, so you can just install it as you would any other R package. So with the uh, profile hit a Markov model that lives within the package, um, we denoise input sequences. So this is how it works. So in black here, there's the uh, uh, input data sequences are being shown. And then for each input sequence, it's assessed with the profile hidden Markov model and a path of hidden states is predicted that associates with the input sequence. So an M indicates a match, which indicates it matches a position, uh, position in the profile. A D indicates evidence of a deletion at that given position. And an I indicates evidence of an insertion. So since we're trying to remove all the errors, we can take this information generated and then make corrections to the sequence. So if there's evidence of an insertion, the base pair is removed. If there's evidence of a deletion, we input a placeholder bar, uh, base pair uh, to accommodate. And since the profile hit a Markov model is a probabilistic representation, it's uh, accurate, but not perfect. And for this reason, we have an uh, experimentally informed set of defaults. Um, and one of these is censorship. So around any given correction, base pairs are masked in either direction of the correction, just in case that the, uh, if the actual error is uh, adjacent to the predicted error, then it is in fact covered up. And this lets us um, remove greater than 95% of errors from our input sequences. When I've done this on simulated uh, data where I know where the ground truth error is. And importantly, 
it also has a very low false correction rate. So for true sequences that are passed into the profile hidden Markov model, it only makes corrections in less than 1% of them. So it's tolerant of the uh, existing biodiversity that we know there is. And so you might be saying, Cam, you only just corrected the indel errors. But as long as we have more than one sequence available for a given specimen or a given operational taxonomic unit, we have uh, just align the sequences by correcting all the indels. And so we can take a drop down average to uh, create a more accurate consensus sequence for any given uh, specimen or operational taxonomic unit. And so it lets us uh, adjacently address uh, substitution errors in, in some instances. So that's how DBAR works on simulate data. And I'll just quickly present uh, two real world applications and how uh, we're using it to correct out uh, errors in real DNA sequences. So the first is using the Pacific Biosciences SQL platform. And we're running this uh, using circular consensus sequencing. Um, and I just mentioned that because most people will have encountered pack bio data where you're getting really, really long sequence reads that are then being used um, to, uh, in genome assembly and things of that sort. But we actually, uh, at, the, at CBG, we do circular consensus sequencing where you run the pack bio uh, sequencer in a circle. So you're getting a large number of outputs for any one molecule, and it's more accurate than when you're getting the long nucleotide outputs. And this is an important data set because it is the uh, method used to generate new reference barcodes for the bold database at CBG. So if we can correct these errors, then we'll be able to generate more accurate reference barcodes. So what I did was I took the initial set of barcodes produced through the circular consensus sequencing process, denoised the data with DBAR, and then regenerated the consensus sequences. And what we were doing is using stop codons as a proxy for insertion or deletion errors. The reason being that since co ones a protein, an important protein coding gene, we would expect there never to be a true uh, stop codon inserted into the middle of it. So looking at the number of stop codons for 27,000 specimens where I did this process, originally the error rate was about 6.3%. So over 1,500 had evidence of an indel within their DNA barcode. After denoising the data with DBAR and regenerating the consensus sequences, we were able to bring the error rate down to about 1.6%, which is a reduction of about 75%. Um, and importantly, of the 1.6% of errors remaining, uh, the program was able to flag 1% of them as issues that it wasn't able to correct. So the false negative rate, so errors squeaking through, is only 0.6%. And so this is important because we're able to not have to re-sequence as many uh, specimens, and we can get more accurate barcodes generated. So a second application of DBAR is in DNA metabarcoding. So this is when you have a large number of individuals and their DNA is being analyzed in bulk. So I use DBAR in the analysis of a mock community of 369 arthropods. And this, these individuals and the DNA was an, analyzed on an ion torrent S5 sequencer. And then subsequently, bioinformatics processing was done on uh, the Embrave platform, which is produced out of CBG as well. And this platform lets us dereplicate uh, sequences, take off the primers, and do all that pre-processing. After that, the sequences were then analyzed uh, in the R environment using DBAR, and we were able to characterize how well we could improve the consensus sequences and the quality of individual sequences. So in this table here, on the top uh, row, we have the representative sequences for the operational taxonomic unit. Initially, of the 398 OTUs, almost a third of them, their consensus sequence or their centroid sequence had evidence of a stop codon in it. After denoising the data with DBARD, regenerating a consensus sequence, we could bring that error rate down to about 1.8%, indicating that we're getting a lot higher uh, quality barcodes for these OTUs. Secondly, um, we were able to look at the exact sequence variants. So this is the individual sequences within each of the OTUs. And initially, almost half of those had evidence of a stop codon, indicating an insertion or deletion error. And following processing with DBAR, we were able to go through and see that there was about a 2.3% error rate. So this is good because we can go and look at the uh, individual sequences with higher confidence, knowing that they're more accurate. So 
Uh, just wrapping up, in conclusion, the DBAR package is able to improve the quality of CO1 DNA barcode and metabarcode data. This is important because um, we're able to generate more accurate reference sequences for the bold database, meaning we don't have to resequence as many samples, so it can save some money. And in metabarcoding, it allows us to get better consensus sequences and better biodiversity estimates. And we can also now have confidence in the intraspecies variation estimates we generate because we know that the individual sequences are likely free of errors. And just as a future direction, DBAR, um, you can use different models within it. So um, it can be extended to be used with other DNA barcodes and other genes in the future. So it's a uh, genes or a barcode specific denoiser, but it can be easily reapplied for other barcodes or genes. Um, and again, it's available now uh, on CRAN and you can also get it through my GitHub page for the development version. So I'd just like to thank uh, all these organizations for providing um, funding, uh, data, and all these people for providing help and their time and just being wonderful collaborators. So uh, that's all I have for you today, and I'm happy to take any questions.